So when we uh, talk about device tree, uh, we really think about describing hardware on embedded systems especially. And uh, in terms of embedded Linux, uh, Linux kernel has been the de facto source for all the device tree maintenance where the device tree files are being maintained and where the bindings documentation is there. But what about the other projects in the embedded software stack? One of them is U-Boot. That is the most widely adopted uh, bootloader project in the embedded system space. So how does it do with the device tree? Or it has been the consumer for device tree for many years now, but do it really maintains the, de the device tree in a way that it should really do? Or whether we do have uh, the fragmentation of device tree when we compare the sources in U-Boot source tree when compared with the Linux kernel. So that's the, th that's the things I'm going to cover as part of today's talk. And let's see the challenges that are faced by the U-Boot maintainers when it comes to device tree man maintenance. And some of my recent work to reduce that burden of the U-Boot maintainers, as well as bringing device tree compliance in the U-Boot project. So something about myself. Uh, so I'm a senior systems developer at Lenaro. I have a keen interest in the platform security, and that has been the part from the beginning of my career. As you could think of security, so it touches the every layer in the embedded software stack, going from firmwares to bootloaders to the kernel and to the build systems as well. So I've contributed uh, various bits and pieces everywhere in the open source and some bits I'm reviewing and some bits I'm maintaining as well. And I've worked on platforms from various silicon vendors like Qualcomm, NXP, TI, Renaissance, Socionext, and so on. So that's the diverse experience uh, that I have, and I'm trying to put some of those thoughts as well alongside today. And something about my employer. So as you may be familiar with Lenaro, so it is the software engine behind the ARM ecosystem. And these are the various work streams that Lenaro has worked on since 2010 and collaborations is the major part of Lenaro or collaborative engineering and collaborations with the open source communities that plays a huge role in there. And this talk is again a part of that only where it was, I wasn't intended to work on this but rather it is the conversations on the mailing list that led me to this talk and so now coming on to the real topic of this presentation, device tree. This is just a primer of the device tree. I hope uh, most of you are already aware about what is device tree. So just to reiterate that, a device tree is a tree data structure uh, with the nodes that describes devices in the system. And the bindings documentation is actually the requirements, which says how the devices have to be represented in the device tree. And the other way to describe device tree is to say that it is describing the non-discoverable devices in the system hardware. And it's not describing devices like which are discover, discoverable on the USB bus or the PCI bus, but rather describing devices which are non-discoverable like on the SPI bus or the I2C bus or the platform bus. And if you are interested in further reading, I have put here the link to the specifications page. You can read out more if you are interested. The second part or the main part that is part of this presentation is where the device tree comes from. So this is more of a generalization picture of an embedded software stack, the firmware, then which loads the U-boot and that loads the Linux kernel and passes on the control. So where does the device tree come from for mainly for the U-Boot and the Linux kernel. So for U-Boot, it has its own source tree where the device tree files are maintained. And Linux kernel, as you know, it's the de facto source uh, where all the device tree are again maintained. 
In the U-boot tree, you would find various combinations. Some, device, some platforms import device trees from the Linux kernel. Some have their customized device trees there. So that's the real part we are trying to address as part of this talk. And there is another thing when the firmware itself tries to use the device tree. In case of U-boot SPL especially, because of the memory constraints of the on-chip RAM, on chip RAM or the static RAM that is very limited on the SOX and the DRAM isn't available at that point. So we can't really fit the full device tree onto the on chip RAM. So instead, the device tree is stripped off, basically uh, dropping all the non essential properties out, out of the device tree and only the essential ones that are being used by the U boot SPL. So here you see the three different uh, device tree sources being used by the different stages. Now, this usage or the different device tree sources, this leads to fragmentation as well in the uh, device tree ecosystem. Now, the third is for the standard Linux distributions. So where does the device tree come for that? Nowadays, uh, uh, U-Boot has been turned with the UFE, UFE compliance so that it could boot up the standard distros. And how does it pick up the device tree? Basically, what the distro vendors do is package all the device trees for every platform in the EFI system partition. And U-Boot is configured to pick up a device tree from that particular directory in the EFI system partition and pass on to that, uh, that to the Linux kernel. So I considered it as a workaround for the current scenario we are in uh, because do the distro vendor really would like to provide the device tree for all the platforms when only one device tree has to be used and really the firmware should be responsible for passing on that device tree rather than the distro vendor. And in, in terms of secure board boot, because I come from the security background, can we really say that distro vendor could sign all those device trees for different platforms? It's the OEM or the silicon vendor which should be responsible for signing them rather than the distro vendor. So these are some of the things that we, we are trying to address. So now coming on to the fragmentation sources for device tree, so this is, the comparison for the Linux kernel and the U-boot versions that were mostly re released on the similar dates, January 7th and January 8th. So as you could see on the left-hand side uh, about the Linux kernel, it's the de facto source and the directories are there. On the right-hand side, there is a U-boot source tree which has this manual DTS files imported from the Linux kernel and the import history is very much scattered. So you could see that the import history, some platforms use the 6.7 uh, particular RC version, 6.6, 6.5, and some platforms used to, are currently using the older 5.15 or something like that. And some platforms may not have updated the device tree for a very long time. So this is the import history. And, we can't say while comparing the device tree in U-Boot and the Linux kernel whether they belong to the same hardware or not. So that is very difficult to say. And when it comes to the bindings, because bindings are not that important for U-Boot to boot up the OS, they, they are very real, rarely synced. So there isn't any bindings compliance checks within U-Boot uh, and they are very rarely synced. And if a platform vendor thinks that, uh, yeah, I need to put some bindings in the U-boot as well, then it's there. But most of the platforms don't do that. And it's because there isn't any compliance checking within U-boot. Now the second source of fragmentation, as you could see here, these, this is just the clock header that I am comparing for this rock chip part. And as you could see here, the clock ID is being a differing from Linux kernel and to the U-boot. So the real question here is, do they describe the same hardware? Uh, can the hardware have different clock IDs for U-boot 
as compared to the Linux kernel. So, and if uh, we try to use the same U, uh, device tree for the Linux kernel as U-Boot is using, the drivers would break because of uh, this difference of fragmentation. The other thing about the bindings, as I said, the bindings uh, are very rarely synced or they are customized. So this is an example for Qualcomm device bindings uh, prior to the work at Linaro we did. Uh, so as you could see, the UART pin control and the MMC bindings in the Linux kernel, U-Boot had very custom set of bindings. So it is, you can say that bindings were only there for the U-Boot use case, not actually about describing hardware, just to satisfy the U-Boot needs. Now coming on to the U-Boot maintainer's nightmare. Uh, whenever we see a patch to import device tree files uh, from Linux kernel, can people easily review that? Or they can say that they trust the developer that they have picked the correct version of the Linux kernel. So it's a nightmare for, actually for me, when I was reviewing the device tree import patches for Qualcomm platforms, I was like, can I really review it? And especially if the Linux kernel source versions differs from one import to the another, can we really compare what is being imported to the particular kernel version? So although we try to say to the developers that put up the Linux kernel version in the commit message, but it's really hard to confirm whether those device trees can be easily reviewed or they can be maintained going forward as well because of no bindings compliance at all. And the second thing is how U-Boot maintainer should enforce the DT bindings check because the bindings aren't synced at all or very rarely synced. And the third is how do we bring uniformity? Whenever we say that uh, I want to compare what device tree is being used in U-Boot as compared to the Linux kernel, how do I uh, do that? Or like uh, when I'm using IMX SOC or I'm using DI SOC, uh, can, can they really be compared with the same Linux kernel version? Can the same distro kernel can work on both uh, NXP SOC or the DI SOC? It's very hard to say. And uh, the other question that I have been repeating again and again, can we really boot Linux with the same device tree that is being used by the U-Boot? And uh, as part of Secure Boot, uh, can I, do I really need to authenticate multiple device trees for the same hardware? That's a, that's a big question on my mind because of my security background. We really want to say that this device tree describes the hardware, not two or three device trees which describes the same hardware. So uh, there should only be a single canonical description of the hardware. Now coming on to standards, uh, the embedded base boot requirements or the system ready IR for ARM. Uh, what this says is that the firmware or the UFE firmware should provide a can canonical device tree that should be consumed by the Linux kernel. Currently, how it's done for the standard distros is like, as I've shown, uh, they pick up the device tree from the EFI system partition and pass that on to the Linux kernel. And U-Boot doesn't use that uh, directly, but it has its own source tree for the device tree. Now, coming on to the benefits for canonical device tree, uh, there, is, there should be a single device tree source file that that is describing the system hardware, not more than one, uh, because it is the hardware description and has to be unique. And the main uh, contribution can be for the Linux standard distribution that they don't have to worry about packaging the device tree files into the EFI system partition, but rather the firmware should be providing it. And uh, there doesn't need to be for a separate DTB to be authenticated, but rather the device tree part of the firmware should be authenticated alongside. There shouldn't be any separate uh, need for authenticated device tree. And uh, this has the other uh, positive that the 
reduce device tree maintenance burden because Linux kernel maintainers or Linux DT maintainers are already putting that effort to maintain the device tree and uh, we can collaborate with them and maintain the device tree coherently rather than two different source trees and there would be extra maintenance burden rather than the single place where the maintenance goes on. And the last bit is we can avoid the project specific runtime or configuration data. So uh, there, 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 there sometimes there is this misconception that device tree can be used for the project specific configuration or runtime data so that we abstract out our own project using the device tree. But that device tree is not the place for that, or I would say the appropriate place, place for that. Uh, device tree is really meant to describe the hardware. So where did my journey begin? So I started with U-Boot, uh, adding U-Boot to the boot chain on Qualcomm platforms. Since Qualcomm platforms has this closed source bootloader and we can't modify or replace that bootloader uh, and simply so I started adding U-Boot to the boot chain on the Qualcomm platforms. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, there, there were heavily customized device tree bindings and device tree files that we had to deal with to start uh, porting U-Boot to Qualcomm platforms. So we started with step-by-step -step conversion uh, to the upstream device tree bindings until my colleague Caleb took on the challenge to directly import device tree files for the Qualcomm platforms. And that actually led me to these discussions during the review with the Linux DT maintainers and the U-Boot maintainers. Can we really improve the situation of device tree within U-Boot? And can we make uh, the life of reviewers and the maintainers with the U-Boot community to be more streamlined uh, for the device tree maintenance? So as I mentioned, I got involved into those discussions and Rob Herring turned my attention to this device tree rebasing repository. So what this repository actually is, uh, it is, uh, you can say an extraction of device tree bindings and source files from the Linux kernel, and they are ext extracted at every Linux kernel major release or the minor release candidates as well. So uh, this uh, motivated me to try to use these snapshots in the U-boot so that we don't have to deal with those import patches, but rather use these snapshots directly into U-Boot and use them directly. So what I did uh, was added support for this automatic import of complete device tree snapshot within the U-Boot tree. And it was actually using the Git subtree that I used. And there were discussions about using submodules or using a tarball. But yeah, we finally reached a conclusion that Git subtree maybe the first appropriate solution to start with and we can further evolve it and if there is a need we can maybe migrate to an, a, another approach as well and the second thing was we need to still augment the device tree file with the u-boot specific hooks which are via this u-boot dtsi files because we don't want to break the backwards compatibility and we want people to start migrating and in turn reducing these U-Boot specific hooks. And to make it an opt-in choice, we added this off upstream kconfig option. And uh, along with that, we added this bindings check in U-Boot. It is uh, named on the similar thing as we have in the Linux kernel, DTBS check as a make file rule because that snapshot is consisting of the device resource files as well as the bindings. So whenever we build a device tree in U-Boot, it would actually, we can actually run DTBS check on that so that whatever modifications we do in U-Boot, they are compliant with the device tree bindings. So how you can run these DTBS checks? So this effort is, already uh, merged upstream in U-Boot, and you can go and try it out. 
and uh, this DTS upstream, this is a subtree and you can just do make DTBS check uh, while building your target. And if you want to just check for some subset of a matching schema files, you can do so via this uh, command line option, DT schema files. So how the future looks like with this off upstream or with this snapshot that is taken from the Linux kernel into the U-boot. So this is the older picture and now uh, with the off upstream, uh, it is using the same snapshot from the Linux kernel. U-boot would be using that and the firmware U-boot SPL, still we need to strip down that, but it would be using the nodes from the upstream device tree file. And this would allow, if we can get rid of those custom modifications in U-boot DTSI files, then we can directly pass the device tree files to the Linux kernel. And that's what uh, we should really aim at uh, and use the single coherent device tree description of the hardware. Now, when coming on to the future of device tree on ARM, uh, so these are the two firmwares uh, that are being used by different platforms, Trusted Firmware and the U-Boot SPL. So these are providing the loaders for uh, the initial or first stage bootloaders. So actually what I think is that the trusted firmware or U-Boot SPL should provide that canonical device tree that is built from the Linux kernel and U-Boot should just be a consumer for the device tree provided by the firmware and Linux kernel should again be the consumer of the same device tree file. And uh, this would streamline the device tree ecosystem much more so that Say for example, on a platform, you have chosen a device tree source from a particular Linux kernel version and you and you know that this Linux kernel version provided device tree would work with U-boot as well as the Linux kernel and this would suffice your platform requirements, then you can just embed that device tree into the firmware and that would work with U-boot and the Linux kernel. Now, these are all the positives, but there are challenges with this off upstream too. The first and the major one being, do we really have a stable device tree ABI? <coughs> Although the documentation is here, uh, but <coughs> there are often DT ABI breakages that are there and the possible reasons could be device tree incorrectly <coughs> Sorry, I need to get some water. Thank you. So uh, the first reason can be the device tree incorrectly described the hardware. So it's a sorry case that uh, it's an incompatible device tree change. This can be uh, a possible reason for the ABI breakage and the early, second one can be an early stage of device tree development for a particular SOC so that there, there was a limited user base and it wasn't uh, something that was pre-thought of that uh, and there, 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 there was a need to break the ABI afterwards because the initial version didn't satisfy or didn't properly describe the hardware. So that could be another reason. The third one could be an actual one where you want to bring the bindings compliance for a legacy DT. Say for example, there were some redundant properties that were being used in the legacy DT and uh, Linux kernel didn't depend on that, but you would may have relied on some of those properties, but due to the bindings compliance, they dropped those redundant properties and it breaked U-boot device tree, basically. So those redundant device tree properties that U-boot relied upon, they get dropped and, and breaks the U-boot uh, booting. The last one is like just for improving device tree, maybe look and feel. Um, and uh, they can be arguments like uh, nobody apart from Linux kernel cares about device tree because 
it's maintained as part of device uh, Linux kernel. So uh, we really need to move away from that thinking that there are projects like U-Boot that is using device tree for many years and we really need to think about uh, the device tree ABI. And some of the mitigations uh, we try to avoid DT ABI breakages is uh, we say that we always sync the device tree snapshot at only the major uh, Linux kernel releases or the dot zero releases. And this would allow, uh, not on the release candidates basically, this would allow somewhat stability to say that the dot zero releases are more stable than the release candidates. And the other thing that uh, the U-boot only syncs when the next branch opens so that there is ample time for the developers to fix any breakages if there is any. And uh, this can be a, a mitigation to say, yeah, they can be DT breakages, ABI breakages, and we know them, but we want to minimize them while working with the Linux DT maintainers. And we, we would make them aware that these kind of breakages are happening in U-Boot. And uh, going forward, we would like to uh, reduce them. So Rob Herring is already working on this DT ABI checking tool. And feedback is very much welcome. If you think that this is part of the ABI and you boot heavily relies on that for your particular platform, your inputs are very much welcome for this tool so that we can have this ABI checking tool for the Linux kernel. And uh, whenever there are DT patches, it could be run and to check the ABI isn't broken via a particular DT patch or not. So this would allow uh, somewhat a stable ABI across different projects as well. And the last one is on my to-do list. So uh, this is a proposal that I would like to push in the Linux kernel community for a sub -arc maintainers profile so that we can make the Linux kernel maintainers for the various sub, sub, sub architectures to say that you boot aggressively syncs the device tree files and we should really care about the ABI for you boot. You should be asking the developers to see whether they are breaking the U boot ABI or not and whether their changes are breaking U boot or not. So this is something I would and I would like to hear from you as well what further things you could think of that how you boot community and the Linux community can work together and try to have this stable device tree ABI so that we can really use the single device tree description in both the projects. Now the other challenge is being how do we handle fixes to device tree? Say for example, of after the dot zero releases, there is a fix and the next branch would open afterwards, maybe the next release, but for this U-boot release, I really need to backport a fix for the device tree. So for that, we allow this uh, subtree to cherry pick fixes from the device tree rebasing tree so that uh, you can uh, let us know or you can post a fix. There is a script available in U-Boot. You can use that to cherry pick any fix to the device tree snapshot and we can uh, merge that in the U-Boot tree. And how do we update these customized uh, modifications via U-Boot DTSI files? Or can we automatically update that? Uh, in, in my view, it won't be too much straightforward to do that. I would rather say that we should try to minimize the U-boot modifications to the device tree or better get rid of them at all. So the properties like boot phase properties uh, that, are, uh, that have been accepted in the upstream bindings, we should try to upstream them more and more to the Linux kernel so that we can have the same device tree source being used in the U-boot and try to get rid of them. It's easier for all the board maintainers and the platform maintainers that they don't have to update these custom U-boot DTSI files, but rather just uh, 
retest your platform after the next sync happens with the Linux kernel. And the last thing I want, would like to thank all the reviewers of the, on the U-Boot community that helped me to review it and many of the challenges that I have discussed here, they were brought up by the community only. So thanks to them. And the next steps for uh, this journey, let's work collaboratively towards a coherent device tree ecosystem and a special call out to the Linux kernel maintainers and the U-Boot Subarc maintainers. They, can they really work collaboratively so that we have a coherent device tree ecosystem? And the last bit is let's switch to off upstream in U-Boot. Try to directly use the device tree from the Linux kernel. The platforms that are, are already switched or they are under the process of migration are these pla platform listed here, MLogic. So MLogic was the first that uh, helped me as my first uh, test platform to with this off upstream patch set. And Qualcomm is the one where we started with, with all the reviews. So, and Marvel, NXP, Renaissance, Rockchip, TI, all of them are trying to migrate their platforms to upstream. And many of them have converted already. And there are patches that are currently under review on the mailing list. So that's all. Yeah, thank you. I'm open to questions if you have any. You mentioned at one point device trees being like primarily the responsible uh, responsibility of like the firmware companies. What like I guess incentives do you see there, or like any problems with incentives or anything like that? Sorry, uh, I'm not sure. I I talked about incentives, but you didn't yeah. know. No. Uh, but I I was mentioning about the firmware's responsibility to provide the device tree. Oh, okay. Yeah. So actually. Uh, the reasoning here is that we should really use the single hardware description. And that should come from the software that is very clo close to the hardware or that's not abstracted out. So it's the firmware that is very much specific to the hardware. And we would like the hardware description to come from there. You can think of it like the ACPI that comes from the BIOS and uh, it is being consumed by the Linux kernel. You can't see any ACPI tables in the Linux kernel, but rather it's the BIOS which, pro which provides it. So on the similar lines, the device tree should come from the firmware. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, how do you feel about downstream development that happens before the SOC is like upstreamed? So like for instance, uh, say we get some hardware feature that's merged in 5.4, um, we push that device tree into the firmware, and then in 5.6, we add support for some new hardware feature, um, but the firmware's not going to be updated. Yeah, uh, I agree. That's a real problem uh, with the firmware updates, that uh, people don't usually do the firmware updates. And uh, that's a real concern, and we should really move towards, because there, there are these requirements that your firmware should be updatable, and you should be regularly doing your firmware updates. So device tree should be part of that updates only. I think uh, whenever you want to update your kernel, you should always consider to update your firmware as well uh, with the corresponding device tree. Uh, that's, that's something. I mean, that'd be a lot of testing that has to happen if, say, firmware's you know, kind of mature for that product, but yeah. all you're doing is a kernel upgrade. And now yeah. you have to go in and, and validate your firmware all over again. I think that might be a lot to ask for from firmware developers. Um, so I, I don't know. It's just yeah. Um, actually, uh, if you take an analogy from the ACPI-based systems, uh, you would think. Yeah. So uh, if you take an analogy, basically, 
we really need, because it's a hardware description. When you say that I change the Linux kernel and update or add something to the device tree, you are really changing the hardware description. So hardware description should be part of the firmware, not uh, the part of what operating system would provide you. <laughs> I agree completely. Uh, I just know that usually there's some upstream discussion that has to happen to say, you know, this is the right way to describe yeah. how firmware, you know, how the hardware should be described. Um, and so, you know, we could write firmware that has a description for that hardware, but it may not be what Linux kernel likes or what Ubuntu likes or anything like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's time for that to get upstream. Yeah, it's always I, be new IP blocks. It's not like it's, yeah, I agree. Uh, there, there has to be discussions or we really need to have a device tree that is well thought of, uh, properly reviewed by everyone. So I know people would like to get their devices to the market as fast as possible or the new features to the market as fast as possible. But uh, really we need to care about the device tree or the hardware description. Uh, we shouldn't push a device tree that is not fully baked in or that is not fully considered. So uh, we really should uh, push uh, towards a canonical de device tree description that is fully discussed upstream and that is that people accept it. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I just know. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the that's the tough part. I I, I agree. So I guess uh, a couple of things, but one of them is is sort of talking about the always updating the firmware, uh, and then with your Linux, that's really hard, certainly. But it reminds me of maybe another possible problem, which is I know Device Tree has some forward compatibility things where you're supposed to be able to take old Device Trees and boot newer kernels with them. Yeah. <clears throat> the opposite isn't always as true. So when you take a new device tree, can you boot an old kernel with it? That's a different, harder problem that people don't often solve. And so I could imagine you update your firmware to a newer firmware, and all of a sudden your older kernels stop working, right? So if you have a dual boot with you know two different OSs and one of them you did update and one you didn't update, you could run into trouble there. Um, I mean, I would also, I guess, sort of agree with Elliot in that, yeah, you can't it's going to be, things are going to be broken, uh, especially like if you someone bakes their device tree into their firmware right at ship time, they probably don't have everything perfect during that first time, and it, it's going to be broken for a while. I mean, I guess I really applaud a lot of the stuff that you're doing up here in terms of sharing the device tree with U-Boot and using it common. I still think if you're you're going to be in a world of hurt if you're going to take the device tree that's baked into the firmware and always use that. It feels like maybe having U-Boot able to ship a device tree as a fallback if the kernel doesn't provide one, that sounds great because then you know maybe you could boot an OS enough for it to figure out what device tree it wants. But having it be the primary and, and main one seems like you're just asking for trouble. Uh, what I think really is uh, this forward and backwards compatibility. That's the main uh, point we should really address it. Because the project, so if you bind the device tree with the particular Linux kernel version, that's really not a hardware description. That's my, my viewpoint. So if you say that it's a real hardware description, that then any version of the Linux kernel should work with it. I, I know that it's not working currently and how Linux kernel handles the device tree uh, nodes and the forward compatibility is not there, but we should try to move towards that. I, I would, so uh, I know there, there, could, there are challenges, but we should, try. because if you think about ACPI, I think they have solved this problem, right? It's simple or hard, but not. Yeah. <laughs> I would raise a counterpoint on ACPI. Um, ACPI is not, mostly not updatable, and you will see ACPI quirks scattered through the kernel to deal with bad ACPI tables. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've always said that, that for, for simple hardware, shipping device trees, fine. You want to do it for a server, great. You want to do it for something that's like memory and a bunch of PCI buses, that's fine. But for like the complex SOCs that have 
massive clocks and interconnects and all of this stuff, it's really, really hard to get that right. It's hard to get that right. Years, years later, we take shipping hardware and we find a serious problem in the device tree that happened to work because of the weird boot timing that we had, right? And then we like, you know, change the boot timing a little bit and trying to deal with that in the kernel and be backward compatible with old device trees is hard. And this is years later, right? So trying to do this on brand new hardware is just, it's going to be really, really hard. And, and so like, I think like Chenya said is like, I would say the day that you ship complex devices in the firmware is the day that someone lands the fix up stage for the device tree in the kernel, right? There's got to be the, before you boot the kernel, before it consumes the device tree, you have a big table of, hey, someone ship me this broken device tree, let's fix it. Someone else ship me this broken device tree, let's fix it. And that's the day that I will accept complex device trees from the firmware is the day that fix up is there. So. Uh, I think I, I, I can see the challenges with all the con complex device tree cases that you have mentioned. But uh, really, if we, if we say that it's a complex device tree and it should be shipped alongside the Linux kernel, that's really an OS abstraction, not a real hard view description. And that's my my viewpoint. Uh, I, but yeah, I've submitted patches for 8650 where uh, you know Linaro has maybe a couple boards, and I go test it on my board, and it just doesn't work. I have to go tweak some small setting, or you know we do an update to some reserved memory node. Maybe that should be coming from um, you know, the bootloader and the firmware that should be telling it where those reserved memory nodes should be coming from. But like, it, it happens. It's, it's yeah, just... Yeah, yeah, agree, agree. There are challenges, but uh, if we say that it's a hardware description, then we should try to solve those challenges. Uh, but if we want to say that it's the Linux kernel and uh, it should, it's only workable with the particular Linux kernel version, this particular device tree, then it's really hard to make that abstraction out for the other uh, bootloaders or the hypervisors as well, or the trusted OSs as well. There can be other projects that are using device tree. You can't solve that problem if you want to tightly bind the Linux kernel with the device tree and a particular version. So uh, if we want to solve the problem for the larger audience, we should really uh, try to solve the challenges that are currently. There. So about the backwards compatibility, it's, uh, most of maintainers would accept it. I mean, Linux kernel is maintainers, but about the forwards compatibility, I think uh, none of the platform maintainers would take this responsibility like that. We stop the <laughs> development because we want the DTB to work with the newer kernel, like to put such requirement. They will just say, I don't have such use case, I don't care, and it blocks our real development. So, you know, people break device tree bindings, break device tree sources, not because they just don't care, although partially true, but because they have work to do. So if you are stopping people from doing work, they will kind of push back. So I think that this uh, forward compatibility kind of uh, is a failure. No one will agree. Yeah, you are right. Uh, actually, uh, if really the point here is if we want to solve the problem for a larger community or we if we bind the device tree with the Linux kernel and we want we, we say that there are real use cases like as Doug mentioned that people could pass the latest device tree with the older stable kernel and maybe a different distro kernel versions would want to boot on the same hardware say for example an Ubuntu kernel which is the latest one or an older Fedora kernel. So there are use cases where the forward compatibility can matter and really would matter. So if if you say that it's only the Linux kernel development that matters, then yeah, we are really not solving the problem for the real hardware description actually. If we uh, I didn't say that it's only Linux kernel open which matters, but there are different kind of requirements and uh, by putting the additional constraints on the Linux kernel development, you will receive pushback. I, I don't mind. You can create such rule, right? Uh, so just get the platform maintainer to uh, agree on this. And I think that no one will agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, if we really want to 
move towards putting standard distros on your embedded platform and you want to support the older distros as well as the newer distros or the various stable kernels you want to support on the same hardware, then really <laughs> you can't say that a particular distro vendor with an older stable kernel to provide the hardware description alongside that. That's a real pain for the distro vendors, I think. The hardware description, if it's meant to be forwards and backwards compatible, then really you can say that my hardware can run any distro kernel version that you could provide. So when, when you say that a platform maintainer could say that it's not really a use case, maybe uh, the broader picture is not clear, or maybe uh, those, uh, the overall picture has to be clarified further or they have to reach out to other people within the same company which cares about uh, different distros or booting up various distro kernels. Yeah. I was just gonna add, I'm trying to think if there's a real scenario where this happens, but I think there might sometimes be hardware blocks that Linux kernel just doesn't care about but if you want to boot some other operating system or, or something else, you know, your device tree should probably describe that hardware, but we're never going to get the bindings or the device tree nodes accepted in kernel because kernel doesn't care, like, kernel's not using it. Yeah, that was one of the arguments that we discussed uh, uh, because the binding should be there. The boot phase properties that U-Boot uses, there is bindings in the Linux, uh, in the in the DT schema for that. So you you aren't restricted by that. You can push all the bindings to upstream, and you should really push them. So even the kernel doesn't care because we there could only be one device tree, and if you have other nodes and uh, description that are consumed by other projects like hypervisor or the bootloader or the trusted OS, then you should push those device tree bindings to the upstream bindings, I would say, yeah. Christoph, do you agree with that? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yes, I mean, uh, if I understand correctly, so that the bindings for the other projects, for the things which are not used by Linux kernel, that they are accepted, yeah. but usually not in the Linux kernel repository, but in the DT schema repository. Yeah. So the, the DT oh, schema yeah. itself. So yeah, the yeah. boot faces also there and a few others. Bindings for other uh, cases, firmwares, uh, Opti also goes there. Yeah, definitely. The DT schema project where it is residing. I think just to, to add on, on that, what the, I believe you're mentioning is not only the additional properties that you would need about the boot phases, but the hardware that the kernel doesn't does not use at all, like the, D, the DDR controller or other pieces of hardware, like the, the firewall or things yeah. like that, that are configured by TFA or Opti, which the kernel doesn't really know exist. Uh, so these can't go to the DT schema repo because I guess that's too hardware specific. So those would normally go to the uh, kernel uh, device stream bindings. And uh, would you accept those? <coughs> I mean, one thing is the binding, other thing is the DTS, right? So, uh, so the binding probably should, oh, this would be the device specific binding. So yeah, this would go to the kernel, but it's not a problem because if you have a kernel user and the user is the driver or a DTS, then you are solved. So there's a DTS in the kernel because you will add the, uh, the node and you add the binding for this DTS. So yeah. So we're good with it. Yeah. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, rather I would not like to have the binding where there is no kernel user because then you don't know who is the, the binding. Yeah, the user in your mission is DTS. As well, yes, yeah. yeah. In your case, the DTS doesn't have compatible that kernel doesn't care about. Yeah, so if the, the, there are DTSs which uh, they don't have any driver which binds to them, it's, well, there are research cases, so this was accepted, right? It's not ideal, but it's. If there's a purpose like here, then yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, actually that's that's something uh, I had some thoughts about it earlier as you did. So that was clarified with Rob and uh, Christoph during those uh, mailing list conversations. Yeah, uh, really we need to have the single device tree binding source and where all the bindings corresponding to hardware can exist. And I know there are DRAM controller specific bindings or DTS nodes that are being used by U-Boot as well uh, to configure the DRAM controller. I would also be in favor of pushing those bindings upstream too. 
so that uh, we can try to minimize those as well and have a common device resource yeah. and have those discussions with the upstream DT maintainers. Yeah. So, uh, is there anything else you would like to question or, or are we done? Okay, thank you everyone for patiently listening to me.